Amen. Praise God. Acts, Acts 4, 20, or Acts 4, sorry. Acts 4. Where am I at here? Yep. Acts 4, 31 says this, and this is powerful. I love, I love the, I love the word of God because it's all so confirming. You said 431? Mm-hmm, 431. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. I like that. I don't know about you, but I need some things shaken up in my life. I don't need the world shaking. I need a God shaking. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. I love that. We're going to go back here in a minute to the rest of this chapter. But doesn't that verse right there sound familiar to something that we read about, oh, probably six or seven weeks ago, out of Acts chapter 2? They all together, 120, gathered up into this room, it's called upper room, and they're praying or waiting for God in chapter 2 of Acts. They're praying and await for this promise of the Father called Holy Spirit. And at this moment, the only thing that they've known about Holy Spirit is that Holy Spirit has come upon people. They, they had no idea what it meant for them, their little body, them, to be literally the temple of God. No clue. And so they're in this room and are waiting for 10 days. I don't know about you, but I get impatient after five minutes waiting on God sometimes. <laughs> and they were waiting 10 days <laughs> and they didn't have air conditioning and they're in the Middle East so you know they probably smell worse than a baby sweat hog on the back of a horse with a gassy mule wow. and um, <laughs> anybody saw my Facebook post the other day knows where that came from I can smell that one <laughs> yeah, you smell that one and here they are in this upper room, all 120 of them. And the Holy Spirit pour, pour, uh, moves. And the Bible says the place was shaken. And as the Holy Spirit begins to move and the place is shaken, they begin to speak in tongues and they begin to speak the word of God boldly. And next thing you know, Peter's having his great first sermon and over, over 3,000 people get saved the first time. And this is like just within the first year, okay? Now, I want you to think about this. Chapters 1 through 5 of Acts is just the first year of the early church. <laughs> There's a lot that happens in that first year. I mean, imagine in your first year, your first sermon, you got well over 3,000 people that get saved. Your second sermon that Peter speaks, there's over 5,000 men, and like Skip talked about last week, that's recorded men, so time you put women and children in there and stuff like that, you might be talking eight to 10,000 people. But imagine in your first year, your first two sermons that are recorded, over 12,000 people come to Christ. Men! And people say they don't like big churches. Well, God did a big church overnight right there. But there was a difference in formatting, and I'm not going to get into all that. There's a difference in formatting because they went from house to house. They had community. But it's interesting how all of this begins to happen. And Peter and John go and they pray over this man. And what I love about this is because we learn that the gate beautiful, the word beautiful means season, it means timing. In other words, God has his own season, he has his own timing, his own place of doing things because we know Jesus had passed this gate many many years for many many times yet the guy was never healed yet Peter and John is at the gate beautiful at the perfect time and after perfect season and all of a sudden the guy gets healed so you know God's got perfect time he's got perfect season for whatever your need is because he's going to get the greatest glory out of it and I think that's absolutely amazing because at the end of the day, he works out all of our needs according to his good. For what? Our good too. Why? So he can get glory. 
And that's absolutely beautiful. So you've got all of this going on and signs, and the Bible says in the first couple of chapters, signs and miracles and wonders is happening, great things are happening. But here comes the religious people getting upset because someone got healed. You might say, oh, churches don't do that. They would be all excited. Boom. I passed through the church where uh, I don't, I'm not going to say where. People are getting mad because people are getting healed. People do that today. Religious people do that. They don't know Jesus. Well, how can you say they don't know? They don't know Jesus because Jesus is a healer. You hear what I'm saying? He's healer. And if Jesus heals and he's healer, why would I get mad when Jesus does something? You hear what I'm saying? Sometimes we just got to get out of the way that God do what he wants to do. But you have all this going on. We got this guy, he gets, set, he gets healed at the gate beautiful. And we find that in chapter 3 and the remaining chapter 4. And now we're finally at the end of chapter 4 and we're still dealing with the anger and the issue of these religious people being mad because somebody got healed. Isn't that something? I'm going to tell you right now, when God moves in your life and he begins to shake up some things, he's also going to shake out some things. The shaking is not about trying to make you feel uncomfortable. The shaking is not about trying to make you feel incompetent. It's not about all that. The shaking is actually to siphon out those things in your life that you don't need to be attached to, people you don't need to be around, things you don't need to be doing anymore, so that all remains is what he wants you to have. And that's what a shaking does. But I'm going to tell you something right now. If you're praying for revival, you're praying for re re reformation or whatever word you want to put in that blank, I'm going to tell you right now when God shakes, get ready for the persecution. Get ready for the trial. Get ready for the troubled times. Get ready for what is going to come as a cost to stepping out of faith and saying, God, I believe this is what you want me to do. Because I'm telling you right now, the enemy does not mess with a sitting target. He messes with a moving target. And when faith stands and begins to move, he begins to attack. The early church, they stood for 10 days waiting on God. The promise of the Father happens. All of a sudden, they're going out. Miracle signs and wonders are happening. Great things are happening. And all of a sudden, it wasn't the outside world. And here's the interesting thing. It was not the sinners that were persecuting the Peter and John. It was the people in the religious community. You catch that? You, you get connected with God and you begin to walk out in faith and do what God wants you to do. It is not the heathens that are going to be coming after you and saying, no, no, no. It's going to be the church religious people. That's who's going to start coming after you. Why? Why, 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 why is that? Well, there's something about faith and how faith stirs up religious spirits. I can't even explain. But it will stir it up. And so then, here we got Peter and John. They're thrown in prison. Right before the Sanhedrin. And Peter and John, they're not, they're not like holding back. Matter of fact, they look at the Sanhedrin and they look at these Pharisees and these Sadducees and they flat out say, hey, the reason why Jesus went to the cross, that's your fault. You're the one that put him there. You're the one that accused him. Even even." Pontius Pilate didn't want to accuse him. He washed his hands of it. But here you all shouldn't have known better, accused him, and sent him to the cross. The one you crucified. And Peter's bold. He don't hold back. Matter of fact, the Bible says that the boldness of the Holy Spirit was on, on Peter so strong. And I, I love how the third chapter and fourth chapter how it explains the whole situation with Peter here. What I love about it is the fact that the boldness of the Holy Spirit was moving so strong upon Peter. And the Bible records they were silent. The religious people had nothing to say. They were speechless. That's pretty cool. 
That, that is absolutely pretty cool. And I, you know, I pray, God, give me boldness of your spirit in such a way that it silenced the mouth of the enemy. That I will be bold and confident to speak truth in such a way that it silenced the mouth of the enemy. And so we get into this fourth chapter and we get into where we are now in verse 23. And we're going to finish out this story about this lame man. And it's interesting how you have almost two, three chapters dedicated to one healing. <laughs> to me, that blows my mind. Because it's not even, at the end of the day, it's not even really about the lame man. It's about the attitude of the people. But let's look at verse 23 of Acts chapter 4. When they had been released, I'm talking about Peter and John here, because they were just in prison for God using them to heal the lame man. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported everything that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices to God with one mind and said, Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, Why were the nations insolent and the peoples plotting in vain? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of, the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant it to your bondservants to speak your word with confidence. I'll tell you what, these people aren't cowards. They're like, God, give us more boldness to face the enemy. We're not backing down. You know, they're, they're not, God, take this away from me. No, they're like, give me more confidence to face what I'm facing. They're like, okay, okay, you, it's like, enemy, you want to battle? Okay. Watch what my God's about ready to do in and through me, and you won't get the last. I'm gonna get the last say. God's gonna get the last say, not you. And so they're praying, and they're like, God, give us more confidence, give us more boldness, help us to stand stronger. I mean, I mean, think about that. When we come to God in prayer and we're facing troubles, most of the time, what do we do? God, take this away. God, do this. But what if we switch our prayers around and say, God, give me the confidence and boldness to stand, to speak your truth. And to plow through this with victory. What if we took a different mindset? Because we, we kind of want to be, uh, how can I put this in a polite way? I don't know if I can. I want to try. Um, we like to stay on the nipple of the bottle too long. Does that make sense? Instead of learning to feed ourselves. And so what we end up doing is, is that when the bottle's not popped in our mouth, just when we start hurting or we get a little pain or we get a little itch or we get a little that or we get a little that, we start crying out like a little baby does. And when we're a baby, there's no problem with that happening because that's what babies are supposed to do. But when you're a grown man and you got a mustache and you got to part the mustache to stick in the nipple, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I don't know how else to say it. And these people here, they're not asking God, you know, feed me. No, what they're doing, they're saying, God, this is what is going on in my life, and it is shaking up all around me, and it is a mess. We're getting prosecuted, persecuted. We're, we're getting all kinds of mess coming against us. We're getting tortured, all of this kind of thing. And they're crying out to God, and they're like, oh, God, give me more boldness. Because I'm going to march right back into that mess with greater boldness and I'm taking victory. They don't say, God, take this away from me. To me, that's just, that doesn't even make sense to my brain. Well, God will deliver you from all your troubles. Okay, go read that passage again. In Hebrew, God will deliver you through all your troubles. Wow. Well, what did Jesus say? 
Jesus said, you live in this world, you're going to have troubles. But then I love what he tells that with. But I've overcome the world. <laughs> so what's he saying? He says, you're going to have troubles, you're going to have trials, you're going to have problems, you're going to have all kinds of messes come up, but I've given you the faith to overcome that because I've overcome the world. Let's go on in verse, verse uh, 29. And now, Lord, now, Lord, look at your, look at their threats and grant it to your bondservants to speak your word with confidence. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of the holy name of Jesus. I love what they're saying. Don't just give me confidence and boldness in the midst of my problem. To continue to stand in truth. To speak your word boldly. But continue to do what you're doing with the signs, miracles, and wonders. Basically, what is they saying? They're saying, what got me in trouble for where I'm at now? God, do it again. Keep getting me in trouble. Wow. To me, that's pretty fascinating. Because what got them in trouble? The miracles, signs, and wonders. This lame man got, gets healed and they did it and it blows their mind. They can't understand it. They begin to take issue with it and it gets Peter and John in trouble. And so when they come to the church and they're saying, here is my report. Here is my trouble. Here's what I'm walking through. Here's what I'm struggling with. Here's what just happened. Here's what they just threatened us with. Here's what they just told us. As soon as they come to the church and they do that, the church cries out to God and says, God, give me more confidence to be bold in my trouble to speak truth. And not only that, keep on doing what you're doing. I know it got me in trouble, but I don't care. The trouble is worth it. That's pretty powerful. Because sometimes we want to run away from trouble. The early church did not run from trouble. They ran right straight into it. Wow. To me, that blows my mind. Because a lot of church circles, what we do, we, 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 I don't know how else to say this. Lord, please help me to be bold but tactful this morning. I don't know how else to say this. In so many church circles, we preach a gospel that looks like a bunch of pansies. Feel good. You, you hear what I'm saying? It, it, it's, it's, like the, it's like the church that, that preaches, oh, come to Jesus and all your problems go away. Well, I'm going to tell you what, when I came to Jesus, all hell broke loose. <laughs> some of y'all here know exactly what I'm saying. But there are some circles that teach that lie. That teach that lie. And there's no truth. There's no principles and scriptures that teach otherwise. And when you get into Acts and you look at what's going on here. In the first year of the early church. They already had to depend upon Holy Spirit. I love the book of Acts. And the reason why I love this is in chapter 2. Jesus said wait here until you get the promise. The promise happens and all hell breaks loose. And I want you to think about this. All hell broke loose, not because of what the disciples did, but because of what God did through the disciples. <laughs> you mean God got me in trouble? Uh -huh. God got Peter and John thrown into prison. What? Think about it. Peter and John walked past this lame man and he gets healed. Do you think Peter and John healed that man? Peter and John didn't heal that man. God used Peter and John to heal that man. And as a result of that man getting healed, they are brought before the Sanhedrin. They are persecuted or thrown into prison. And I'm, talking, I'm not talking about like the county jail. I'm talking about a hole with chains and nasty and rats and everything else. They're thrown in this. All because they said, God use me. I'll wait for the promise. I'll be bold enough to wait for the promise. The promise happens. The shaking happens. And all hell breaks loose. Some of us in our lives, we got to be careful what we pray for. 
You're, you're, you're praying for a shaking. You're praying for a revival. You're praying for a reformation. You're praying for all of these things. But do you really want to know what you're praying for? Because it might cost you something. It might hurt a little bit. That's okay. Let me ask you this question. When God answered your prayer, are you going to be a whiner because it turned out the way it did? Or are you going to be a thank God it happened that way? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times when we pray and we're believing and we're trusting God for something, it turns out a different way than what we really expected. And you know what? That's okay. That's completely okay. Because we don't have all the answers God does. And sometimes we can't see the big picture because we're blinded by what was right in front of us. Does that make sense? And sometimes we have to allow God to remove the stuff that's right in front of us so we can see the big picture and say, God, that's what I really need to run for. And so you have this early church that are crying out to God. They're, they're, it's, it's crazy. Verse 31. When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. In the congregation, those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abandoned, uh, abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each to the extent that any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite, the Cyprianian birth, I guess that's how you say that, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, owned a tract of land. So he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. It's crazy how God moves, persecution breaks out, and instead of the church taking a perspective of, oh, it's me, God to get me out of this, they take the perspective, let's go a celebration. They find us worthy to be persecuted. <laughs> to me, that's mind-boggling because it does not match today's society at all. Today's society, what do we want to do is we have our troubles and we're praying, God, take my troubles away. And I'm not saying that's a necessarily a bad prayer, but what if God had allowed troubles to be aligned in such a way to teach us some character, to teach us faith? To teach us how to love our enemies. Because, you know, sometimes it is hard to love your enemy. You know? I mean, if you're like me and you got the little bit of humanity that is in you, which most of us, if you're like me, probably have a lot of humanity in you still. A lot of times you just want to throw punch your enemy. I know it's probably wrong. I just called about to a bunch of people. Yeah, I just did. Get over it. But, but we struggle with that. Why? Because, because God's trying to develop character in us. He's trying to develop some things in us that we do not have. Or maybe some things we have that we need to get rid of. Like throat, pun throat punching people. You know, I mean. And so God is trying to move in our life and trying to get us into... These, these areas where we can change our perspective from one of doubt and self-reliance to one of faith and God-reliance. And sometimes that's hard. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's hard. Because we get so overwhelmed with the circumstances that are right in front of us, we can't see the forest for the trees, as they say. Which I never quite understood that analogy, but it sounded good right there. We couldn't see the forest because of the trees. And so we, we struggle. We struggle. 
and we have this move of God that shows up and we pray for a move of God and we're hitting a dry spot and God shows up, promises begin to happen. He begins to shake us because if you notice in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit does a shakening. And then right after Holy Spirit does a shakening, the next shakening coming is the persecution. And the persecution begins to shake us. Here's the thing I love about this. When I look at chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, I don't one time find Peter and John in the church sitting back and saying, well, I'm sorry that, that Jesus healed you that way. I really did not mean it like that. I really shouldn't have said it like that. I really shouldn't have done it like that. I, I really shouldn't have, you know, have that, you don't see these shouldn'ts. You, you just don't. What you see is a confidence that's rising up inside of them that basically is kind of in a kind of, you know, I don't know how to say it. It, it, it kind of in this manner of, you know, I really don't care. This is the confidence of the Lord, and this is what God's wanting to do in and through my life. And so I'm going to do it, and this is where we're going to walk, and this is where we're going to go, regardless of what the cost is. And you see that perspective, you see that whole mindset begin to take place in them. So they begin to develop this at an early church in their first year. The first thing that God teaches them is perspective. Think of that. Perspective. They could have been like Elijah. You know, they're going to go and they're going to fight Jezebel or they're going to fight, you know, this wicked, you know, Jezebel. And Jezebel, she doesn't speak these words. And what's Elijah do? He goes into a tree, gets all depressed and oh, he starts crying and wants to just kill himself is what the Bible says. Right after, he had just destroyed kings. I mean, God called down fire from heaven. I mean, could you imagine that? Could you imagine having stacks of wood out here? It's as dry as can be, and we water everything down, and a good pour down rain comes in here, and all of a sudden we're like, God, okay, whoop, and all of a sudden all stacks of fire begin to burn. That's exactly what happened with Elijah. Yet he loses perspective, gets doubt, gets scared, and goes and runs and tries to kill himself. He just wants to die under this tree. And God and, he prayed, and the angels of the God, you know, angels of God try to come to him and support him and everything else. And what's that what ends up happening? God tells him, asks Elijah, he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Why are you here? I didn't send you here. Well, why are you here? And some of us, we have lost so much perspective of what God was trying to do in our life, where God is trying to lead us, where he's wanting us to go, that we are in this place. And God is like, what are you doing here? And I'm not talking about the physical place that you're at. I'm talking about spiritually. I'm talking about mentally. I'm talking about financially. I'm talking about your relationships and all these areas of your life. Is God today speaking the words, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Because he wants you to go face your Jezebel. He wants you to go face this. You know, we talk about this all the time in, in, you know, outside of church, but in different circles. God wants you to go face your demons. Does that mean that we have to return back to abusive things and stuff? That's not what I'm saying. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm talking about you personally. Your character, your person, the things that you, 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 you. The things you need to face about you. That's what I'm talking about. God wants us to walk in faith so we can walk in redemption, we can walk in success, we can walk in meaning of life. To watch him do some great things. You know, I, I can't even imagine being in that first year of that early church. Wow. <coughs> to me, that's mind-boggling. Just mind-boggling. 
Have you ever waited, waited for God or a promise or something like that and then he shows up and it happens and it's like, whoa. It's like all hell just breaks loose against you. I'm telling you, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. I want you to think about this. This is something I did. We can call this bold or we can call this foolish. But the early church took it so literal. And them having the power of God in their life, the anointing of God in their life, that they literally showed up at the temple at their hours of prayer. Knowing the Jews did not accept Jesus, they showed up at the Jewish temple anyway to pray. Now, could you imagine standing outside, you know, with somebody in town and they're worshiping Satan, like they're in the occult, and you stand outside their house and you start praying right for that house you're staring at. Knowing they could come out any minute, knowing they don't believe in Jesus, knowing that you probably might get somebody mad. And here we got the disciples in the early church they're literally going to the temple and praying with the people that put our Savior on the cross. That's mind-boggling to me. Because when you look at Peter and John and are passing this layman, where was it at? Going to the temple at the time of prayer. When you find, when you find just in the first four chapters, what do you find? Peter and John, the early church, they're going to the time of prayer. Where the prayer is important, don't get me wrong, but look what they saw prayer as. They saw prayer not just as an opportunity to pray and speak to God, but they also saw prayer as an opportunity to witness. Because they knew that the Jews, they didn't have no power. They may have the truth, but they had no power. Why didn't they have any power? They didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't believe Jesus was rose from the dead. I love the boldness of their early church. They knew that going to these temple meetings and the things that, that they could face could be persecuted. But they didn't care. They're like, I'm going anyway. I'm going anyway. The first, the first year of this church just blows my mind. The first year of the early church Chapter 5 of Acts, chapter 5, 41 through 42, Luke sums up the first year of the early church. And this is how he, this is how he sums it up. It's like, dang, man, that's, that's exactly what I want. Of course, we're past our first year, but I still want it. Listen to what he says, Acts 5, 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, where are they at? In the temple courts. Day after day, they went back to get persecuted again by the religious people. That makes no sense to me. I want you to think about this. They are going back to the house of pain. Where, what was their biggest pain in their life? Their biggest pain was the religious people that was rejecting them, that was rejecting Jesus. Yet day after day, they were going back to the house of pain. That to me, I'm like, God, I don't even want to go near the house of pain. I don't even want to go anywhere close to the house of pain. God, I want you to save me from the pain. And here you got the boldness of the disciples to sum up this first year. And they said day after day in the temple courts 
And from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. But in verse 1, it says the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had counted worthy to suffer for his name. What was they saying? I'm counting it worthy to have persecution. I'm counting it worthy to have trials. I'm counting it worthy to have troubles. I'm counting it worthy to walk through mess and feel like hell is all around me because I'm living for Jesus. This is what the mindset of the early church was. They're like, I'm living for Jesus and I don't care what it costs me. I don't care. And if trouble comes, and heartache comes, and pain comes, and trial comes, and upset comes, and doubt comes, and whatever else comes my way, I don't care because I'm going to count it worthy to suffer for his name. And this was the perspective of the early church in the first year. That's pretty mind-boggling. Because they saw trouble and dove into it. They didn't see trouble and just... Mm, go hide. <laughs> no. They saw trouble and they ran right forward. And they were like, uh-uh. You see that? That might be a house of pain, but it's going to become a house of miracles. That might be a house of shame, but it's going to become a house of blessing. That might be a house of, 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 of a persecution, but you know what? It's going to become a house of prayer. That might be a house that has been talking bad about and shamed and, and put down and, and stabbed and when I say stabbed you know stabbed in the back you know gossip slander whatever you want to call it all that other mess that goes on but you know what this is going to become a house of encouragement this is going to become a place where people get fed and, and healed and delivered and strengthened again they had a different mindset they didn't run from their troubles but what they do is they embraced their troubles and gave them to God and say God here it is Give me boldness to take a stand in the midst of this. To proclaim your truth. To keep moving forward. That I could take what the world is trying to give me as pain and turn it in for your glory. Because some of us in here this morning, I believe this message is exactly right. This right timing for you. Because they're, they're, it, it, even, even for me, I was pretty, I put this gun, I'm like, God, oh, okay, I'm preaching to myself. You know, you do that all the time, right? <laughs> yeah. But the timing could be more perfect because some of us are walking through what we can almost consider hell in our life. Some of the problems and trials and relationships and struggles and the things that are going on. And if we're not careful, we'll lose focus and we'll lose perspective and we'll get caught up in our trouble and our pain. And our pain will become our house instead of praise becoming our house. And we need to run to the house of praise. While we're standing in the midst of pain. Because these disciples, that's what they did. This early church, that's what they did. They ran to the temple, the house of pain. That where God got the glory. Where God saw a lame man walk. Where they were able to preach the gospel. Where they're able to see thousands of people come to Christ. They went to the house of pain and turned it into the house of praise. Where God got the glory on. And there's some of you this morning, there's some things you're walking through. God is just waiting for you to get a different perspective and for you to sit down, and I'm going to say this as polite as I can, and for you to shut up and listen to what he's saying. And say, God, there it is. There it is. Yeah, I know I'm pain. I know I'm struggling. I know I've got some stuff. I, I know, I know, I know. But you're still going to get my praise. You're still going to get my glory. You're still going to get my thanks. Regardless of how I feel, regardless of what I'm walking through, regardless of what I'm struggling with, you're still going to get it. You're going to still get my heart. You're going to still get my all. You're going to get my everything. 
If you pray for God to expose truth, don't get upset when truth is exposed. You hear what I'm saying? God wants to expose truth. He wants us to walk in truth. He wants us to live in truth. But we can't get upset when it begins to reveal truth about our own selves. You know, it's, 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 we can get real honoring when God begins to reveal truth about other people. We can get real honoring. Let's just get real. We can't. Because of what we know, because of what God's showing us and things that become evident. We can get real honored if we're not careful. But when God starts pointing a finger at you, ooh, we don't like that kind of revealing. We don't like that kind of exposure. Well, God, it's okay you do that with over here with them, but Lord, no, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? And God's like, wait a minute. I thought you said you want to walk in truth. I thought you said you want truth to be exposed. I, I thought you want to live this, this path I've called you to. And they're like, well, not like that. Well, you're okay when it happens to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but Lord, that's not me. <laughs> and God's like, uh, that's more of you than you think it is. And we're like, ah, no, 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 no. Why? Because it, it upsets us and it, it gets us uncomfortable. You know, all of these other, you know, things that are going on. And God is saying, hey, you're the one that prayed for revival. You're the one that prayed for restoration. You're the one that prayed for the shaking to happen. You're the one that prayed for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You're the one that came and said, I want to be used. And I want to be used in my city and in the kingdom and all that. You're the one that came to me. And now I'm doing it, and now you're mad at me because of the way I'm doing it. That's what we do. That's exactly what we do. Sometimes, like I said, we just need to sit back, shut up, and say, I'm listening to you, Lord. That's hard. That can be hard. The early church was shaken from inside. They were shaken from the outside. But the most important shaking that they had was from the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you now, when God begins to move, when the shaking begins to happen, and when God begins to pour it out, God will expose things. He'll expose the demonic. He'll expose the hypocrites. He'll expose all kinds of flaws. He'll expose all kinds of things. And here's the thing that we have to be really careful about. When he begins to expose, we can either walk in judgment or we can walk in grace. And sometimes it's hard. Our well, prayer is that we would err on the side of grace. Because when God begins to show things, begins to expose things, we're going to see things about people when God begins to move, we don't like I'm not saying justify sin. I'm not saying be okay with sin. No, call sin out. Sin needs to be called out. Sin needs to be, needs to be dealt with. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just human flaws. Just the realization that, hey, we are not perfect people. But we need one another. That's beautiful. I've seen, I've seen so many people over the years, unfortunately, when God's been getting to do a shaking and house cleaning, so to speak, and you know, the Bible says judgment starts in the house of God first. I've seen so many people over the years when this begins to happen, what do they do? They begin to walk away from God, and a common statement they make is if church people are like that, I never want to go back. <laughs> it's like, yeah? What they're not realizing is the Lord is cleaning a house and he's exposing things so that the house can become more pure. So the house can become more like him. So that when the, so that when the world sees the reflection of the church, they see the reflection of Christ and not of us. 
But we can't get to that place until some perspective changes in our own heart where we quit taking a seat when exposure's on us, but when exposure's on us instead, we do like James chapter 1 tells us. It says, oh, I see the man in the mirror and is looking back at me. And oh boy, I got some work. The early church did this. They took that perspective and they did this. And they're able to see if God move in a big way. When Holy Spirit pours out, when God begins to do some shaking, when God begins to change some things, we either let the enemy win by us leaving, or we become part of the answer by staying and say, Lord, I may got hurt, I may got exposed, I may have things that are happening, I might got whatever. But you know what? I'm sticking around. I'm going to stick around because the game isn't over. The play isn't over. The movie isn't over. Life isn't over. Jesus ain't done. It's just started. It just started. But the sign of a little bit of trouble, what we do, we run. We're like a little rabbit. Found out this week my dog loves bunny rabbits. Oh, thanks. Loves bunny rabbits. And uh, yeah, lots of bunny rabbits. I had to save a couple. Yeah, I had to save a couple. I had to save a couple this week too from Banks, buddy. <laughs> he loves bunny rabbits. But you know, the thing is, you, and I saw this, I had this little bitty bunny, but it's just a baby. He's probably about that big, you know. He's in the corner, and Banks has got the Banks has got this rabbit in that corner. That rabbit's just sitting there. I mean, the whole body of this little rabbit's just shaking, and you can hear any little rabbit sound or whatever it makes. And Banks is just, I mean, you can tell he's just savoring at the mouth. He loves rabbit. And I'm like, dude, come on, man, it's just a baby. And this little thing's just trembling. And so I, so of course, I pushed Banks back and I grabbed the little rabbit and I let it go in the yard, you know, this out this way. It took off. About a couple of days later, there's a baby rabbit in the yard again. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I catch the baby rabbit and I let it go again. But you know what was interesting about this baby rabbit is every time it got cornered, it was froze up and it started shaking. Here's the thing. If it didn't get cornered and it didn't freeze up, but realized that it could probably outsmart my dog. My dog's big, but he's not as fast as a baby rabbit. If he didn't forget who he was as a rabbit, he probably wouldn't have had to freeze up in some corner somewhere just shaking like this, waiting for me to pick him up. Release him. But sometimes in life, what happens is, is trouble comes our way, and what do we do? We freeze up like a baby rabbit, and we're like this. It's exactly what happens. And what happens is we forget who we are in Christ. We forget that we need to cry out to God like the early church did, and saying, God, I'm in the midst of pain, but I'm praying for boldness anyway. God, I'm in the midst of trial, but you know what? I promise, I'm, I'm praying for victory anyhow. God, I, I don't know what to say. God, the last time I spoke for, spoke for you, uh, Lord, I got in trouble, but God, I'm praying you help me speak more boldly in the midst of truth and trial and everything else that's going on. Lord, that you would help me be even better than that. But we hide in these corners like little rabbits and we're just shaking, hoping someone will come to deliver us. But what if nobody comes to deliver you and God's expecting you to remember who you are? I never heard preaching like that before. What if God doesn't want to deliver you? He wants you to remember who you are in Christ. And instead of being like that scared little rabbit in the corner, you realize, hey, you know what? I'm a little bit faster than a dog. I got dogs on my heels, but you know what? There's a fence I can fit through that he can't. There's a covering over your life called the blood of Christ that enemy can't cross. You can't cross it. 
And Jesus said it. I love how Luke writes it out. Luke, Luke said it this way when Jesus told the disciples and they sent them out two by two. He said, you go, you do miracle signs and wonders. You raise the dead, you heal the sick, you do all this. And I'm telling you right now, no harm will come near you. He didn't say trouble wouldn't happen. He didn't say trials wouldn't come. He didn't say all these things wouldn't happen. He just said it's not going to harm you. In other words, you may go through it, but at the end, you will be the winner. You're going to be the winner. And when you look at these first three chapters of Acts, you look at these first four chapters of Acts, you look at these first five chapters of Acts, and what did you find? You find that early church learns the perspective, I'm a winner. I'm a winner. The enemy may try to cross that bloodline, but he's not going to. He may try to cross that fence line, but he can't. Because we have the blood of Jesus that we're covered in that he cannot cross. He cannot harm us. He cannot hurt us. He can't get past it. He can't get through it. But I'm telling you this morning, church, it is time that we rise to our position in him. Realize who we are and not think back. And say, God, help me be more bold. Help me to run into the trouble instead of away from it. God, help me not to necessarily be more confrontational, but Lord, help me to be a person that can run into trouble and stir up a little bit of mess, shake it all out, and watch Jesus fall out. That's probably a weird analogy. I think you get my point. Don't shrink back. Oh, well, if I tell that to them, they're going to get so mad and so upset. So what? I'm not telling you go be malicious and mean. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you stand for Jesus. Stand for truth. We live in a culture. They're not afraid to get in your face about their junk. Why are we so afraid to get in their face about Jesus? Well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Well, they don't care about hurting yours. They don't care about taking your rights away. They don't care about taking your days away. They don't care about perverting things that mean a lot to you. I'm not saying go carelessly like we don't care. But what I'm saying is it's time to take a stand. It's time to pray for boldness. It's time to pray that God uses us in the midst of our, 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 our continent, our country, our town, our, our county, or wherever, we, wherever you want to call it, or wherever you're at, that God begin to use us in such a way that we see that trouble and say, God, that is yours. Do what you want. I'm running in it. I'm running in that mess, not from that mess. Because I know my God can fix it. I know my God can turn it around. I know my God can do the impossible. I know he can take the impossible. He can take what seems impossible to us. He can turn it around for his glory. Paul, Paul wrote this in Philippians 1.21. I love this verse. Talking about perspective. He writes this. He says, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What a perspective. What's he saying? He's saying, I don't care what it costs me. Irregardless, if it costs me here as a martyr, or if it costs me pain here, it don't matter. Because I'm living for Christ regardless of what it costs me. Regardless of what it costs me. And if they destroy me, so what? I gain heaven. I gain heaven. What if we got so heavenly minded that we become earthly good? What if we took the perspective of Paul that is so heavenly minded he becomes earthly good? You know, I, I used to hear the old, old phrase, don't be so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. <laughs> really? No, I want to become so heavenly minded that I become earthly good. <laughs> Take the mindset of Paul. We're 
gonna have trouble. We're gonna have trials. It's inevitable. But our perspective means everything. It means everything. We can either run to it, trusting God, or we can run from it. But I'm going to tell you this, if you run from it, they'll start chasing you. And you don't want troubles chasing you. You want the goodness of God chasing you. I'm not sitting here and saying that we need to pray, God, bring all the troubles. That's not what I'm saying at all. That would just be foolish. But what I am saying, what is it that you need to face? What is it that you need to man up to, woman up to? And say, God, here it is. Give me the boldness. Give me the clarity. Give me the ability to stand in your truth. Help me to be like the early church. That I counted worthy to suffer for your name. That I'm not going to be a whining baby when I suffer for Jesus. But I want to say thank you, Jesus, that you found me worthy to suffer for your name. He found me worthy to suffer for his name. That he found me worthy to walk through this trial because somehow or another he knows that walking through this, I have in me the ability and strength through the Holy Spirit to walk through and see God get glory. That somehow he's able to trust me walking through this so that he gets glory out. That, that doesn't even, when, when, you, when you wrap your mind around that, it's like, God, that don't even sound like a, God, I don't hear too many preachers preach like that. That's okay. I'm sorry you've been lied to. Life has trouble. But Jesus is the victor. He's the one that gives you the victory. He's the one that gives you the ability to stand. He's the ability, he gives you the ability to go on. He gives you the grace to go on. Life is not a peaches and roses. And I'm not saying all this to try to discourage you or to get you down in the gloom and goom and all this other stuff. That's not why I'm saying all this. I'm saying all this because if you feel like you're in that little corner like that little rabbit and you're just shaking to death, remember who you are in Jesus. Remember who you are and then give him praise. And what I love about this in, in chapter 4 of Acts, and this is where we're ending, what I love about this in chapter 4 of Acts, it, it, was, it was when they went and they gave the report to the people. They had a negative report, and they gave a negative report to the people. They cried out to God, standing on his promises. And what happens? The place is shaken, and the Holy Spirit is poured out again. What does that tell me? That tells me that sometimes we need a little bit of refueling. You know what I mean? We need to come to God and we need to be refueled a little bit. We've been walking through some mess and we remember where we came from. We remember what we received. Now we're walking through the mess. We come to the house. We're like, God, here's my troubles. God, here's my pain. God, here's, what's the, here's the report. I'm not going to deny the report. This is the report. This is what's going on. This is what's true. But God, I'm giving you the praise because I remember your promise. And because I remember your promise, I'm going to hold to your promise. And what happens is they pray. The Bible says they prayed and the Holy Spirit was poured out. And all of a sudden the place was shaken and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Boldness. To me that is unbelievable. Did their problems go away? Well... As we get into the book of Acts, we're going to find out we just warming it. But in that first year, the church had to learn some identity. They had to learn 
that when pain happens, turn it to praise. When shame happens, turn it to blessing. When discouragement happens, run to joy. When you feel defeated, remember that you are nobody without Jesus, but he's the victor that's in your life that makes you victorious. That when you feel like everybody in the world is talking shame on you and bad on you and junk on you and trash on you and everything else, know that Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father interceding on your behalf every single day, saying, this is my son, this is my daughter. Bless them, take care of them, deliver them, work this out for them on your behalf every day. When you feel like there's nobody praying for you, Jesus is. That's beautiful. I don't have to walk around nobody prays for me. Get out of your mullet grubs and realize that Jesus, the Son of God, prays for you. Jesus. That's pretty powerful to me. You need some prayer agreements? I don't think there's anybody more perfect that's going to pray in the prayer agreement than Jesus. I don't know how. I don't know what you're walking through today. I don't know what you need from the Lord today, but I do know this. He's got all you. He's got all you. Some of us got quit running. We just got quit running. Turn around for a minute and say, all right, Lord, I'm stopping, I'm shutting up, I'm listening. Got quick running. Some of us, we need to get up and not fear the trouble. You know, I've been, I've, I've walked some, I've walked through some things and. Some people here real close to me that, that, that um, well, my wife, kind of real close to me, especially, right? But know some of the things that I really have walked through in the last four to, four to six weeks while she was gone. It hurt. And there's been times I wanted to walk away and say, forget this. It ain't worth it. There's been times I've been fearful. Times I just wanted to sit down and just, I'm done. I'm not talking about being known to y'all. I'm not talking about being known to church. Just done. And something inside of me, every time I feel that way, every time I think that way, something inside of me would rise up and say, thank you, you are. You ain't a quitter. You don't give in. You don't quit. The whole fear thing, you know better than that. I love you more than that. When, 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 you, when you have the Holy Spirit literally speak to you, when you're, when you're kind of scared on something, and you literally hear Holy Spirit speak to you, son, you know better than that? Because you know I love you. You better listen up. And this morning, some of us have walked there. Some of us are there. Some of us are walking into that. And I'm telling you this morning, God has all you need. Don't run from him. Run to him. Yeah, but if I run to him, I know he's going to ask. Will you quit? Quit being a rebellious little kid and say yes. It'd be a whole lot easier. It'd be a whole lot easier. Let's pray, Father.